Hello, and welcome to chapter 15, which is where we're going to start talking about glucose catabolism. And today we're specifically going to be discussing glycolysis. So overall, over the next several chapters, we are going to be discussing several different aspects of glucose metabolism, which you can see summarized here in the diagram on the right side of this slide. So in chapter 15, the chapter we're going to talk about today, uh, we are going to be discussing glycolysis, which is the breakdown of glucose into pyruvate. And during this process, um, we are going to end up forming some ATP, as well as reducing um, the electron carrier NAD plus into NADH. Then in chapter 16, we're going to move on to essentially the reverse of glycolysis, which is glucose synthesis from, from pyruvate back up to glucose. Um, and we're also going to talk more about glycogen metabolism, the both the buildup and the breakdown of glycogen, which is the polysaccharide form of glucose, which we see up here. Then in chapter 17, we are going to move a little bit further on down the pathway. We're going to discuss the conversion of pyruvate to acetyl-CoA using the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. Um, and then we'll move down into the citric acid cycle. And during the citric acid cycle, we'll see more uh, reduction of two different electron carriers, NADH and FADH2. And finally, in chapter 18, we'll sort of bring everything to the last part of this, which is um, the process of making ATP um, uh, from those reduced electron carriers, um, where those electrons get passed through the electron transport chain and go through oxidative phosphorylation, um, helping uh, the cell to ultimately make ATP, which is the general energy currency of the cell, as we know. So um, once again, in this chapter, we're going to start from the beginning with glycolysis. So here we're going to start with an overview of glycolysis, then we'll go through all of the reactions of glycolysis, and then we'll end up with a discussion of some of the regulation of when and how glycolysis is going to happen in a cell. Some of the other things in chapter 15 in the textbook that we will not discuss in class are fermentation, the metabolism of non-glucose sugars, as well as the pentose phosphate pathway. Um, so if you're interested in those, um, I encourage you to uh, you know, read more about them, but we will not be discussing them in the context of this course. So first of all, um, before we can get into the, the weeds with glycolysis, first we had to talk about where is glucose coming from? Um, so we already know that uh, glucose or polysaccharides um, enter into our bodies um, nutritionally from our diets. Um, but how, how, do, how do glucose monomers actually get into our cells? Um, and they, they do this using a glucose transporter. Um, we've discussed, or we should know now, that um, glucose molecules are very polar, um, very soluble, and so it's, uh, they cannot pass through a cell membrane by themselves, right? They need help from a transporter. Um, and we've already seen a couple of examples of the glucose transporters here and there in a couple of other previous chapters. Um, but just so we know here, there are four glucose transporters, GLUT1, 2, 3, and 4. Um, and they are differentially expressed in different tissues. Um, in this course, we're going to be talking mostly about liver and skeletal muscle. So we'll be really focused more on GLUT2 and GLUT4. Um, and we'll discuss their functions a little bit in later on in other chapters. Um, but uh, the other glucose transporters also work um, in a fairly similar way. Um, once glucose does manage to enter the cell through the glucose transporter, um, it's all set. Gly glycolysis takes place in the cytosol of the cell. So glucose doesn't need help to enter, especially into any other organelles inside the cell. So what exactly is happening during glycolysis? Um, we start out with a molecule of glucose. Hopefully that's not a surprise by now. Um, and we turn it into two molecules of pyruvate. And if you'll notice, um, glucose has six carbons in it, right? One, two, three, four, five, and six. Um, but you'll see pyruvate on the right only has three carbons. Um, so essentially, part of what's happening during gly glycolysis is we're cutting a glucose molecule in half to get two different halves, which are ultimately converted into pyruvate um, over several steps. In fact, there are 10 steps in glycolysis, and we'll go through them all in just a moment. Um, but first, let's take a look at the overall glycolysis uh, reaction. So we start with one glucose molecule, which is turned into two pyruvate molecules, like we just discussed. Um, during the course of this reaction, we also have the reduction of the electron carrier NADH, 
and two NAD plus uh, molecules are reduced into NADH. Um, we also have the net conversion, uh, the net um, synthesis of two ATP molecules. So two ADP molecules and two phosphates are ultimately made into two ATPs. Um, and then uh, water and some protons are also some other byproducts of this reaction. Uh, so ultimately this reaction is fairly helpful for making some energy currency within the cell. We have two ATP molecules, which can be used as energy currency right away. And we also make two NADH molecules, which later on down the line in the process of um, like the electron transport chain and oxidative phosphorylation um, can help make more ATP. So let's take a look at glycolysis as a whole. Um, Overall, there are two main stages of glycolysis. The first stage, stage one, is the first five steps, 10 steps total. So the first stage is the first half step, one, steps one through five. Um, and this happens once per glucose molecule. Um, this step actually requires some energy input. Um, two ATPs are actually used up during this uh, stage of glycolysis. Um, and so this is often thought of the preparatory stage where the, um, the cell is sort of getting glucose ready to extract energy from it. But before energy can be sort of gotten out of it, a little bit of energy has to be put in. And this is two ATPs. And we'll talk about those steps um, in detail later on. Um, and during stage one, um, all of the metabolites that are formed pretty much have six carbons in them. Stage two is the second half. It is steps six through 10. Um, and this happens twice per glucose molecule. Um, and the reason this happens twice is because at this point, the glucose has essentially been cut in half into two three carbon metabolites. Um, and so th these, these steps six through 10 are done on each half of glucose. So in a sense, they happen twice per glucose. Um, and this is um, the stage where energy is recovered. So four ATP molecules are created or um, synthesized during this stage. Um, so overall, if you subtract out the two ATPs that got put in during stage one, um, there is a net yield of two ATP molecules uh, for every uh, cycle of glycolysis uh, per glucose molecule. Um, and also during stage two is when the two electron carriers, the two NADH molecules, or, excuse me, the two NAD plus molecules are reduced to NADH. <laughs> um, and like I mentioned, during stage two, this is mostly the C3 metabolites. Um, and the, at the end, we end up with pyruvate. So overall, we start with glucose and with pyruvate. Um, we synthesize two ADPs. We reduce two NADHs. Um, and we end up with from one six carbon molecule to two three carbon molecules. Uh, so let's start breaking that down. Um, let's see how that happens. Why are these slides not advancing? Okay, so, excuse me. Yeah, so let's start with the first step of glycolysis. Um, this is, the input for this step is glucose, that's the substrate, um, and the enzyme that catalyzes this step is called hexokinase. Um, and so the name gives you a little bit of information about this reaction. Um, hexo, hex, hex meaning six. So we have a six carbon sugar, which is glucose, um, and kinase. Um, and we've talked a little bit about kinase um, enzymes. These types of enzymes catalyze the addition of a phosphate group onto a substrate. And that's, that's what hexokinase does. So um, the, the substrates are glucose and ATP. And hexokinase then adds a phosphate group onto the six carbon of glucose, making glucose six phosphate, or G6P. Um, and so during this process, because a phosphate group is removed from ADP, ATP and transferred onto glucose, we um, essentially we are hydrolyzing ATP into ADP. This is one of our energy input um, steps to kind of get things going. Um, and so um, the next step after that, we have our glucose 6-phosphate. Um, and the enzyme that catalyzes the second step is phospholuglucose isomerase, or PGI. So from the name here, you can, again, get some information about what's about to happen. So phosphoglucose, this is our substrate, right? We have a glucose with a phosphate group, with a phosphate group on it. Um, and the enzyme is an isomerase. And as we recall, isomerases um, change the arrangement of atoms within the substrate. 
And that's exactly what phospholipoglycose isomerase does. Um, it takes glucose 6-phosphate and it rearranges things, moves things around to end up with fructose 6-phosphate. So um, essentially we started out with glucose, which is an aldose sugar. We moved the carbonyl group to create fructose, which is a ketose sugar. Um, and essentially the, the other um, parts of this molecule mostly, mostly stay the same. Um, but in order to actually carry out this reaction, there's a little bit more complexity that goes on. Um, it's not as simple as just, you know, grabbing a, a carbonyl group and moving it. Um, so what, what actually happens is the, the glucose uh, ring structure is opened up. Um, then the isomerization reaction happens where the carbonyl group is essentially moved. Um, and then the ring is closed up again. Um, and let's look in a little bit more detail on how that kind of works by looking at the linear structures of glucose and fructose. So like we said before, glucose is an aldose. So we have an aldehyde group at the end. Fructose is a ketose. Um, and so the carbonyl group is moved from carbon one on the glucose to carbon two on the fructose. Um, we already know that the, the six carbons on these are actually not hydroxyl, right? They have a phosphate group attached. Um, but just for, um, but that doesn't change, right? That's the sort of, to keep things straight for ourselves in our minds. Um, but all the other um, arrangements of, of atoms on the other carbons do remain the same here. So once you open that ring on glucose, that carbonyl gets moved down and the ring closes up again, um, we end up back with that um, fructose 6-phosphate. So um, that brings us to our third step. So now our input, our substrate for this third step is fructose 6-phosphate. Um, and the enzyme that catalyzes this one is called phosphofructokinase. Um, and again, this is going to give you some information about what, what this enzyme is doing. So our substrate is fructose 6-phosphate, and that's right in the name here. Right? So we have fructo and phospho, so meaning our fructose 6-phosphate. Um, and again, we have a kinase. So this molecule, um, as you might have guessed, is going to add another phosphate group onto fructose 6-phosphate. Um, and that's what we see here. So we have our... Um, yeah, this is our second energy input uh, step where we have um, ATP is donating a or transferring one of its phosphates, phosphate groups onto the fructose 6-phosphate, the other substrate. Um, ultimately, so we end up with fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. Um, and for short, we can call this molecule F1,6-BP, which is still kind of a mouthful. So a lot of times this one is just called FBP1. Um, this is to differentiate it from another uh, fructose with two phosphates on it, which is FBB, FBP2, which we'll discuss in a little bit. Um, but this one we call FBP1. We're sort of assuming the, 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 the phosphate on the six carbon is there, and the one is telling us, reminding us that the other phosphate is on carbon number one. Um, so again, this is an energy input stage. Uh, the ATP is getting its phosphate group transferred onto the other substrates, fructose six phosphate. Um, and you'll also notice that this reaction is one directional. It's essentially irreversible because it is um, it has such a large negative delta D. Um, and one of the uh, consequences of this is that this is our major rate determining reaction for the whole glycolysis pathway. And we'll go into why and how that is um, a little bit later on in these slides. So let's go on to our fourth reaction. So our fourth reaction, um, the substrate here is our FPP1, right? Our fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. Uh, here it's shown in the linear form. Um, and the enzyme that catalyzes this one is called aldolase. Um, this enzyme doesn't tell us at first maybe as much about what it's ultimately going to do to the substrate, um, but let's try to piece it together a little bit. Um, so we you might know that an aldol refers to a molecule that has a carbonyl group that is two carbons away uh, from a hydroxyl group. And we do have that here in our substrate, FBP, FBP1. Um, and what aldolase essentially does is it is, uh, cuts this molecule um, right in that location, right in between carbon three and four. And so the, uh, the result of this is we have two different products, sort of the top half and the bottom half of this six carbon molecule. So now, now we finally cut our original glucose 
we, well, we changed our original glucose into this intermediate, fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, and now we're finally chopping it in half into our two pieces. And those two pieces are called dihydroxyacetone phosphate, or DHAP, which we see at the top. Uh, this one is a derivative of acetone, which you might be familiar with as a three-carbon molecule that has a carbonyl group on carbon two. Um, and then it's dihydroxy, and because there's uh, hydroxyl groups on carbon one and three, but the hydroxyl group on carbon three also has a phosphate group there. Uh, so ultimately, this whole molecule is dihydroxyacetone phosphate or DHAP for short. Um, the other half of the um, fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, the, the carbons 4 through 6, end up as this molecule that's shown on the bottom, glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, or GAP. Um, this molecule is named essentially because it's a derivative of glycerol. Um, we might be familiar with glycerol when we were learning about our triacylglycerols from our lipids chapter, where glycerol um, itself is a three carbon molecule that has a, hyd a hydroxyl group on each of those carbons. Um, here we have glyceraldehyde because carbon one is oxidized to an aldehyde. And then on carbon three, of course, we have a phosphate. So um, ultimately this molecule is called glyceraldehyde three phosphate or GAP. And so, yeah. And so one of the, one of the reasons that, um, this reaction is able to happen is because reaction two that we discussed um, a few slides back from glycolysis, where we isomerized uh, glucose into fructose, um, allows this to be an aldol cleavage uh, between carbons three and four. If, um, if we had left that carbonyl group, um, this one here, um, if we had left that carbonyl group on carbon one, like it is in glucose, um, to do that aldol cleavage, that would actually end up occurring in between carbons two and three. Um, which would then we would end up with this sort of asymmetrical cutting uh, where you have a two carbon and a four carbon product, um, which would end up just essentially making things asymmetrical and making things more complicated down the line. Um, this way, it's, in, in a way, it's much simpler when we can, um, since we moved this carbonyl group to carbon two, we can now we're able to cut this molecule right in half between carbons three and four. Um, and that way, these two three carbon products, DHAP and GAP, are ultimately able to be sort of funneled into the same set of enzymes that we see in the stage two of glycolysis. Um, and you might be asking, how does that work? Because DHAP and GAP are not the same molecule, right? They each have three carbons, but they're not exactly the same. Um, and we're going to see why in our next step of glycolysis. Um, so our next step of glycolysis involves those two products from our last reaction, we have glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate, GAP, and dihydroxyacetone phosphate, DHAP. And the enzyme that catalyzes this step is called triose phosphate isomerase, or which is um, for sure you can call that one TPI or TIM. Um, and from the name here, uh, we can also get some information, right? So triose, meaning a three carbon sugar, phosphate. Each of these three carbon little sugar derivatives has a phosphate group on it and assemblies. So we know that we're going to be rearranging some of the atoms within these substrates. So uh, TPI uh, actually just catalyzes the interconversion from GAP to GHAP and also the reverse reaction of DHAP to GAP um, uh, fairly equally. Um, but in the case of glycolysis, the reaction we're sort of interested in is this direction where G DHAP is converted to GAP. And ultimately, this is going to help make our original glucose um, through several intermediates make two copies of GAP, which are going to then enter stage two of glycolysis. So before we move on to stage two, uh, first let's summarize stage one. So we started out with the glucose. We had a few different steps. First, we had a phosphorylation, then an isomerization, then another phosphorylation, and finally a cleavage. Some of those steps were reversible. Some of those steps were not reversible. Uh, we had the input of ATP during those two irreversible steps. Um, and ultimately, we end up, we started with a six carbon molecule. We ended up with two three carbon molecules that are going to now enter stage two um, as two of these GAPs. So let's move on right into stage two. 
So we have the, that GAP molecule, that glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate. That's our substrate for this next reaction, reaction 6. And the enzyme that catalyzes this one is called glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate dehydrogenase. Um, this is a little bit of a mouthful again, but um, you can get a lot of information again from the name of this enzyme. So the first part of the name, glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate, that's the name of our substrate. The second part of the name is dehydrogenase. Um, and this is going to tell you what the enzyme does. Um, and so this enzyme, dehydrogenase enzymes, are always involved in redox type reactions. And that's what we're seeing here. So we have our GAP substrate, we have our electron carrier NAD+, which is oxidized, um, as, well as, a, as well as a phosphate. Um, and then GAP-DH helps to catalyze this reaction where um, GAP is oxidized into 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate. Um, and so what's happening here is this aldehyde group is essentially getting oxidized and the phosphate group is also getting glued on right over there. Um, and to help during this process, because 1,3-BPG is oxidized in comparison to GAP, um, NAD plus at the same time is getting reduced into NADH. Um, and so ultimately, this NADH is going to be helpful later on down the line for during in the uh, excuse me during oxidative phosphorylation, um, and we're going to carry on the 1,3-BPG um, through the next step of glycolysis. Um, and so this is just a summary of what's going on here. So GAP is getting oxidized, and the phosphate group is getting attached right there at that arrow. And again, this is happening at the same time that NAD plus is getting reduced to NADH. Um, and like uh, just a reminder, like I mentioned before, um, starting with stage two, this is happening twice for every glucose molecule. Um, so we're just showing sort of one half of our original glucose molecule um, reacting here. But really, you can think of this reaction and the next reaction, the next set of reactions are all sort of doubled, right? We have our two three carbon products. They're each going to enter this stage two from now on. Um, so that brings us to step seven. So step seven, now we're starting with our 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate that we just made. And the enzyme that's going to catalyze this one is called phosphoglycerate kinase, or PPK. Um, and once again, from the name, we can get some information about what this enzyme is doing. So the first part of the name is telling us about our substrate, phosphoglycerate. This is our glycerate right there in the name, right? Phosphoglycerate. Um, and then kinase is telling us that a phosphate group is getting added. So let's see what happens. Um, and so this one is a little bit interesting. Um, it's essentially what, um, or yeah, so yeah, it's interesting because it looks like we're removing a phosphate, right? We start out with a molecule that has two phosphate groups on it. Our product has one phosphate group on it. Um, and so this particular enzyme is actually named for the reverse reaction. Um, so don't let that sort of trip you off when you're when you're looking at this. Um, but ultimately, the product of this one is 3-phosphoglycerate, or 3-PG. Um, and here we're having um, this phosphate group that's getting removed from the, the one carbon is actually getting transferred onto an ADP. Um, and that's helping to create some ATP. Um, and this process, like we mentioned before, is called substrate level phosphorylation um, because the substrate 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate is directly transferring a phosphate group right onto ADP. Um, and this is substrate level phosphorylation um, is a separate and distinct process from the, um, the synthesis of ATP that we'll see later on during oxidative phosphorylation. Um, and, and this is finally for seeing some uh, sort of energy output, right? We had a couple of ATPs that we put in during stage one. Um, and this is the first time in stage two that we're seeing finally that we're creating some ATP from this process. Um, and so because once again, this is really happening twice for every one glucose molecule that gets put in, um, we really made our first two ATP molecules. So finally, we kind of paid back the energy debt from our first stage where we used up two ATP molecules. So now we're sort of at um, no net usage or gain of ATP at this point. Um, so that brings us to our next step. So we have our substrate input 3-phosphoglycerate, 3 3PG. 3 um, and the enzyme that catalyzes this next step is called phosphoglycerate mutase. Um, and we should hopefully recognize that a mutase is going to um, catalyze an isomerization reaction where one group is getting um, moved to another location on the same substrate. We're just rearranging the atoms within a molecule. 
Um, and that's that's what it looks like phosphoglycerate mutase is doing, right? This phosphate group on carbon three is ultimately moved onto carbon two. Um, but what actually is happening is a little bit more complicated than that. Um, so this enzyme, phosphoglycerate mutase, actually has a phosphate in its active site. Um, and so what really happens is 3-phosphoglycerate enters the active site, um, and then a phosphate group gets transferred from the enzyme onto the 2 position of 3-phosphoglycerate, um, and this creates 2,3-bisphosphoglycerate as an intermediate. Um, after that, the uh, phosphate group on the 3-carbon of uh, the 2,3-bisphosphoglycerate is given back to the enzyme, um, and so finally the product that's released is going to be 2-phosphoglycerate. Um, but 2,3-BPD is hopefully familiar to us as um, from our hemoglobin chapter, uh, because 2,3-BPD is that molecule that helps to stabilize the T state of hemoglobin. So at this rate, um, we are getting near the end, we're on step nine, um, and we have our 2-phosphoglycerate. Um, and the enzyme that's going to catalyze this one is called enolase. Um, this is another enzyme that um, maybe might not give us as much information about what's going on as some of the other ones. Um, but we, um, we know that an enol is a type of molecule where we have two carbons double bonded to each other um, next to an alcohol and a hydroxyl group. Um, and that's what we see in our product, right? We have these two carbons double bonded, and then we have C, C2 and oxygen. Um, but that what would be a hydroxyl group is actually a phosphate group. Um, so that's why it doesn't quite look like um, an, a hydroxyl right there. Um, but ultimately, um, that's what happening. That's what is happening to phosphoglycerate um, is getting turned into an enol. Um, and, it is, and the enol is called phosphoenol pyruvate, or PEP, or PEP. Um, and so, um, uh, yeah, and this type of reaction is, this type of enzyme, excuse me, is a lyase, right? Because we are um, uh, removing a group and we are creating a double bond in the process. Um, and it just so happens that one of the products of this is water. Um, and so phosphoenol pyruvate um, is another high energy intermediate. Um, this phosphate group um, is happy to be removed. And um, I just want to point out that this type of reaction, like we said, it's catalyzed with a lyase. Um, and so um, we don't want to confuse this with a hydrolase, right? So if you consider the reverse reaction, where you're adding water to phosphoenol pyruvate to make 2-phosphoglycerate as the product, um, this is still not a hydrolysis reaction. Even though we're adding water, um, the product, which in this case is on the left, um, doesn't get broken, right? We're not using water to break any bonds in the in the substrate. Um, we're simply um, it's simply being added into the substrate, essentially. Um, so what's happening here is the these atoms are being removed um, as water um, and forming a double bond. Um, there's no uh, cutting apart of the substrate, and so this is this is why we call this one a dehydration type of reaction. Um, and this molecule could, all, excuse me, this enzyme could also be called a dehydratase. Um, it's also a lyase, like I mentioned. Um, and this is different, um, just in case anyone is confused by these words. This is different from a dehydrogenase, uh, which we mentioned before. Um, dehydrogenases help to catalyze redox-type reactions. Um, and we already just discussed how hydrolases are um, catalyzing hydrolysis types of reactions. Um, and that is not what's happening here. So finally, we have reached our 10th step of, hydroly of, excuse me, of glycolysis. <laughs> Uh, where we have our phosphoenol pyruvate substrate. And the uh, enzyme that catalyzes this one is called pyruvate kinase. Um, and this is another one of these enzymes in this process that's actually named for the reverse reaction. So let's take a look at that whole reaction. So in this case, our product is pyruvate. And if you imagine this reaction proceeding backwards, you have pyruvate here, which does not have a phosphate group on that second carbon. Um, and then phosphoenol pyruvate does have a phosphate group. So if you imagine the reverse of this reaction, this enzyme would be adding a phosphate group to pyruvate from ATP, transferring it right on there. Um, hence the name pyruvate kinase. 
although that's not what's actually happening. This reaction is another one of those irreversible reactions that only proceeds in the one direction that we're looking at on the slide, where the phosphate group is being removed from phospholinyl pyruvate and being added to ATP to create our second uh, set of ATPs. Um, and once again, this is called substrate level phosphorylation because our substrate is directly um, lending or donating its phosphate group to the ADP. Um, and this is finally the point at which glycolysis becomes sort of net ATP um, creating, right? Um, at our last step where we made ATP, we sort of just reached a zero point because we had used up two ATPs um, in the very beginning in stage one of glycolysis. Um, and then now that we're in stage two, um, we finally are creating ATP. And just as a reminder, once again, this is happening, this particular reaction, all the reactions in stage two are happening twice per glucose molecule. So at this point, we are making two ATPs as a net bonus. <laughs> um, so um, yeah, so just like we said here, it's one ATP for every substrate, for every one time this reaction occurs, um, which means that we have two total net ATPs for every glucose molecule that goes through glycolysis. So let's now look at a summary of everything that just happened during stage two. So we started with our two three carbon metabolites, um, which were the two ATP molecules. We went through a few different reversible reactions where we made some high energy compounds. We carried out some and after we made those high energy compounds, we used those phosphate groups to do substrate level phosphorylation. Did that once here from 1,3-BPG to create 3-PG. We did it again from PEP to create pyruvate. Um, there was also a rearrangement in there where we saw our 2,3-BPG intermediate. And um, ultimately we have created pyruvate. And that is where, um, that's the one irreversible step in our stage two. And um, that's where glycolysis essentially uh, ends, right? <laughs> the net result of glycolysis, like we mentioned, is we make for every glucose molecule a total of two NADHs and two ATPs. Uh, so now let's get into more about the regulation of glycolysis. Um, so like we mentioned in chapter 14, when we were getting introduced to metabolism, um, we know that enzy enzymes that help to catalyze uh, reactions that are more exergonic, meaning more spontaneous, more negative delta G, um, these types of enzymes are able to be highly regulated. So in the case of glycolysis, um, the enzymes that have these large negative delta Gs are, there's three of them, right? And we can see these large energy drops in this diagram here at step one with hexokinase, at step three with phosphofructokinase, and at step 10 with our uh, pyruvate kinase. And so, um, but we are gonna see um, uh, why we really only primarily use phosphofructokinase as the enzyme that's gonna be really regulating glycolysis. Um, and why is that? So why don't we use something like hexokinase? Um, this is because not every glucose molecule actually proceeds through glycolysis using step one, using hexokinase to catalyze step one. Um, for example, we've already talked a little bit about glycogen metabolism when we talked about the regulation of glycogen phosphorylase a couple chapters ago. Um, and we talked about how glycogen, when you cleave off a glucose using the phosphorylase, you end up with a glucose 1-phosphate molecule. Um, and glucose 1-phosphate actually gets made directly into glucose 6 6 phosphate using a different enzyme. Um, and ultimately, this is bypassing the need for hexokinase in the first place. Um, so it's not a great um, idea or a really efficient thing to use hexokinase as the regulator of glycolysis, since we already know that some significant portion of the glucose that's going to enter into the glycolysis pathway doesn't actually use hexokinase. Um, why don't we use, so that's hexokinase, that's why we don't use it. Um, why don't we use pyruvate kinase? Um, well, first of all, pyruvate kinase is the very last step in glycolysis. So if we're going to regulate glycolysis um, only use from the 10th step, um, that means steps 1 through 9 can just go on sort of whenever and however they want. They're unregulated, um, which would be pretty inefficient, right? Because we already know that during steps 1 through 9, there are a couple of steps where we're using up ATP. Um, we don't want to do that unless 
we don't really, unless we know we really have to or want to. Um, so that's why pyruvate kinase is not really a great option for regulating glycolysis either, um, which is why we're really left with phosphofructokinase, which catalyzes that third reaction. Um, and we already mentioned how this reaction is unidirectional, um, and it is also rate limiting. And just on the bottom of the slide is just a summary of that reaction that phosphofructokinase is catalyzing. Uh, fructose 6-phosphate is um, getting, we're taking a, a phosphate group off of ATP and putting it onto the one carbon. So let's talk a little bit about more about how PFK is regulated. And to do that, we'll have to learn a little bit more about PFK's structure. So we know that PFK is a tetramer. Um, and like some of the other molecules we've talked about, has two different states. There's an inactive T state and an active R state. Um, and fructose 6-phosphate, the substrate in this reaction, binds preferentially in the R state, which is the active state. Which makes sense, right? The active state is going to bind preferentially to the substrate, and the inactive state will not, because the active state is what's going to help catalyze the actual reaction. Um, and so PFK has both activators and inhibitors, Activators are going to bind and stabilize the R state to help, um, you know, make this enzyme want to catalyze reactions. And inhibitors are going to preferentially bind and catalyze and stabilize the T state, um, so that PFK will be less active. So let's break down when and why that might happen. Um, so for this part, let's start considering different conditions within the cell, within the environment of the cell, um, and whether or not PFK is going to be activated and inhibited, and what allosteric effectors help do that. So our first condition is when there is plentiful energy within the cell. Um, in this case, if there's a lot of energy around, um, would we want to proceed with glycolysis? Um, if there's already plenty of ATP and the cell is happily or using it as energy currency, um, glycolysis isn't really necessary. Um, because there's already plenty of ATP, and the whole point of glycolysis is to help cells make more ATP. So in this case, when there's plentiful energy in the cell, PFK is going to be inhibited. And the effector that does this is ATP, which makes sense. If there's lots of ATP, PFK doesn't need to do its job and um, help essentially make more of it. There's already plenty of it around. In the um, opposite case, when there's scarce energy, um, that's when glycolysis is going to be necessary. So PFK is going to be active. And some of the effectors of this are ADP and AMP, which makes sense, right? When ATP is used as an energy currency, one or two phosphates end up get, getting cleaved from ATP, resulting in more ADP and AMP. Um, and when, like we said, when there's low energy levels, um, ADP and AMP are a sign of that, um, which are ultimately going to help activate PFK to go through more glycolysis um, to ultimately help the cell make more ATP. Um, then let's think about two other sort of energy conditions. So first we're considering energy levels. Now we're considering nutrient levels. When there's lots of glucose within the cell, um, there, this is a case when um, PFK is going to be active because there's plenty of glucose available. So this might be the time to start breaking it down and doing something with it. Um, and some of the effectors that are going to help PF tell PFK to help do that are insulin and um, an FBP2. So we already talked about how um, insulin is released um, after um, intake of nutrients to help bring glucose into cells. Um, so this is a case where you have insulin signaling. Now glucose is going to be plentiful within cells. Um, and one of the sort of byproducts of metabolism is, or of this insulin signaling, and this metabolism is FBP2. Um, so we already discussed earlier on in glycolysis how FBP1 is one of those intermediates um, where it's fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, um, the 6 is implied. FBP2 is the other version of this. So it's called FBP2 because it's uh, fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. Um, it's a sort of variation on fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. Um, and this effector is essentially telling us we already have, um, we have plenty of glucose, um, Let's go on and break it down to make more energy. Now's the time to make energy. And finally, the opposite condition of this is when glucose is scarce. Um, and so this is going to be the opposite condition. PFK is not going to be active. If there's not a lot of glucose around, um, you can't break it down because it's not there. Um, so there's no reason for PFK to be active. 
Um, instead, this might be a time to start making more glucose, um, which we'll talk about in later chapters. And that process is called gluconeogenesis. Um, and so the allosteric, it's not really an allosteric effector, but it's another hormonal signal that sort of indirectly makes this happen, um, is called glucagon. So um, ultimately, regulating glycolysis and gluconeogenesis have to be coordinated with each other. And part of the, re the way that happens is through insulin and glucagon signaling. Um, and we'll talk more about that in chapter 16. Um, and the reason they have to be coordinated is because they're essentially a cycle. Glycolysis is taking glucose and breaking it down into pyruvate. Gluconeogenesis is taking pyruvate and building it back up into glucose. And so if both glycolysis and gluconeogenesis were both active, um, there would just essentially be this kind of feudal cycle where as soon as you break one molecule down, you'll start building it back up. As soon as you build it back up, you break it back down. And it's just really a waste of energy and time for a cell. So really, if uh, one of these processes is active, the other one needs to be inactive in order for anything uh, productive to happen. Um, so with that, now you should be ready to start answering some of the chapter 15 practice questions.